I think a really good um, skill to have when doing this is just to be, you can say, open-minded and curious. Um, curious as to maybe you learn something new and you most uh, probably will learn something new. Swallow it. Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Greiner, your host for today's Swine Ed podcast. And with me today, I have Josephine Tulinus, who is with Cloud Farms. Josephine, how are you today? I'm very well, Laura. Thank you. How are you? I am doing well. Thank you. I'm glad to have you on today, Josephine. Uh, before we get started, I think it'd be really helpful for our audience to get to know a little bit more about you, and then, then we'll kind of jump into the topic today. Yes, um, let's start from, uh, not from the very beginning, but uh, I have a master's degree in animal science from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, I live in Denmark. Um, then I had a child right after I finished my studies, and then I joined Cloud Farms, which is a, a software company that provides management system for pig production. And I've been with Cloud Farms for two and a half years. Started off as a technical support manager, uh, helping customers starting up with the program, um, helping them with issues that they may have. And since I've kind of slided into a more like support lead role, um, which involves a bit more strategic thinking around how we do our support and how we help our customers developing tools, um, giving even better support in terms of setting up some alarm systems for catching problems before they become problems for our customers. Um, so that's been very interesting and has challenged me um, in many ways, but in, in great ways. And um, so one of the things I think is actually quite interesting about your background is that you do have a master's degree. Uh, what is your master's degree in specifically? I mean... From the university, it's just called animal science. Um, uh, I wrote my master a thesis in nutrition, actually, <laughs> haylage for horses, which has nothing to do with pigs at all. Um, but my, my key interest was for sure in nutrition. Um, and that's because I think I was just really, I just really like numbers and data. Um yeah, so that was the maybe the unofficial, like, direction of my degree. Curious to discover if you can manage your animal data and team's work with the touch of a finger? Some of the best and largest pig farm holdings worldwide use cloud farms to collect and analyze data like never before. How? With the most advanced mobile app to collect data accurately and super fast. For breeding, farrowing, weaning, and finishing. Also, this is the easiest way to assign tasks to your team and motivate to work more efficiently. You instantly understand what gets done on time and what doesn't. So yes, you can manage your animal data with the touch of a finger. I think that's okay. I think most of us start somewhere with a career in horses. I, I had that same passion going through my undergraduate program as well. Um, but I, and this is why I was asking, because I think this is really interesting for our conversation today. And so um, actually a couple of different interesting conversation points. But I'll start with the idea that that uh, you have an advanced degree and you've moved into a technical company. And I want to be careful with that because there are many, many professionals who go to work for companies and serve in a technical service role but usually it's something related to what you do, right? So horses and silage, you would probably work with a horse food company and, and talk technical support, but you truly went into an IT technical company. And so how did that, actually, how did that happen? And how did you manage that transition from maybe the true science into, I don't want to say IT is not true science, but biological science to more of a intellectual technology science and that's a very good question because you know when when i went to school and university all the job opportunities you were presented for were like getting a phd or like working in advisory company or the feed companies like the companies that you speak of laura the science companies right um 
And like a company like Cloud Farms, like an IT company, that opportunity was never presented to me. But I was sitting there, you know, my studies were finished. I had uh, my second child and it was just, uh, I think, the first year of Corona outbreak. Um, so I had to, you can say, uh, really research anything that I could. Um, and then I, I fell upon Cloud Farms and I read the job description. And I mean, even though I did my master uh, thesis in horses, I really enjoyed working with pigs. That was I did my like bachelor thesis in pigs. So pigs was already within my radar already, you can say. Um, and the job just had so many like really nice upsides to it. I could work from home, um, working with pigs, uh, sit within a Danish team. I mean, there were so many things that really appealed to me. Um, so I joined the company and I've just been really excited about it uh, since. I will say that when you go to school, um, you are um, used to figuring out all the answers yourself. You can always read a textbook. You can look up articles, uh, Google, and you can sort of like reason your way towards the end goal while joining an IT company. Like my skills only go to a certain extent, right? When we start, I can do like very, very simple code if I have like a prescription or a recipe from developers, but other code I just cannot do anymore. And um, and that took a bit of uh, transitioning into realizing I cannot do everything by myself. Uh, but I think it's also a very important lesson to learn, really, that it's okay to depend on others and it's okay that you don't know everything because you do what you do really well and they do what they do really well. So I think that was the biggest uh, transitioning for me to realize. I think that's really a, a great point because we we definitely are not knowledgeable in any in everything when we graduate school. Uh, we know pieces, right? And but it's more as you just mentioned, it's the training. It's the the training to be able to seek out answers or to find the resources, and that may be people, that may be books, um, that might be a variety of places for those resources. So I think that's a, an excellent point. I'm um, thinking about your undergraduate training though, would there have been courses or something you would have done differently uh, in order to, to step into a technology focused company? I would for sure maybe have liked some training in, or not training, but like some introduction to, to a bit more coding like how to code a basic um, programs. I mean, my knowledge about statistics that you need to know for making articles. Um, I mean, that has helped me quite a, a big deal, but simple code language would have been nice. Um, but I mean, that's very, you can say, special towards working with IT uh, companies. But I think in the like in the environment we're in where more IT companies come for for the uh, agricultural world, I think that could be very relevant to kind of uh, bridge the gap a little bit and introduce some terminologies uh, that are commonly used in IT companies. That could be like APIs, um, different integration languages uh, to make it a bit easier. <laughs> yeah. But I do think you share a unique unique aspect. And I, I know there are others that I visited with that have worked in the, the technology side of, of agriculture, which we, we all desperately need. Um, but they have, again, the more traditional animal science training and, and that communication between the computer science individuals and the animal science individuals can be a little challenging, perhaps. But uh, on the opposite side of that, though, you, you talk about customer development. And so when you are outward facing with the customer and you're talking to that producer, I think it's unique because then you have the ability to talk in a language that you believe they'd understand because you're still learning the opposite side as well. Um, so how does that change to talk from to the computer science within the company to turn out and talk to the producer on the other side? I actually think, think that, um, I use many of the same terms. I feel like I have to speak 
like, even on a lower level when I speak to our developers within the company. Um, whereas with a, a farmer, you can speak a bit more like on his terms using the, the right words. Whereas with developers, you need to go on like a lower level um, and really explain a bit more uh, not detailed, but yeah, maybe a bit more detailed and make sure that they really understand when you say, like, for example, um, a guilt. So is it a first served sow or is it a, a maiden not yet served? I mean, that is really causes for uh, for confusion where you speak with a farmer. There's no problem at all. Um, but I also actually find it very funny when you talk to farmers and they suggest like a feature to you. And they say, oh, but, you know, this feature, it's going to take like one day and then it's fixed. <laughs> and then you think, you sit and go like, mm, well, okay, I can see how it's simple for you, but may maybe not. So you have to try and, and also actually translate the other way sometimes. Uh, but then you have to do this and this and this. And have you thought about the data? Should that be into like a report or should it be, you know, nice graph? Like what do you want to do with the actual data? So it actually goes both ways that you try and be that mediator really and try and deliver the information in a nice way for, for both parties. I can I can remember doing that when working with some of our, our record keeping systems, even just those same conversations, right? Well, the, the records are already there the numbers are already inputted. So this should be a really mm -hmm. simple fix and, and it becomes a very long process, right? But <laughs> yeah. I think that's actually a really great, great conversation. And, and I think that it's it's actually kind of funny around the guilt um, because we, we had those conversations many times um, when we would change even record systems, depending on where the record company was from, the guilt was defined differently or a P0 is defined differently. And, and so mm -hmm. I think that's actually really intriguing. Um, what other challenges do you see maybe uh, stepping into this type of role that, that we should be aware of for those that are, are thinking about it or that are intrigued by it, um, that they could, you know, either be prepared for or to, you know, take additional courses in, you know, are there anything else that you'd like to share around that? I think a really good um, skill to have when doing this is just to be, you can say, open-minded and curious. Um, curious as to maybe you learn something new and you most uh, probably will learn something new and um, but skill wise I still think it's it's reasonable to accept that I'm not a developer so I will not be doing code and that's okay maybe that comes down the road um, but it's okay to have the skill set that you have and and it's also great that you want to learn something new i think that's also very important that 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 we realize that i don't have to pre pretend to be a developer because we already have those so my skill set is is great as it is uh, yeah so just out of curiosity when you work for a, a company that's working on software development how often are you on the farm collecting information from producers or farmers um, either ones that are already owning the, the software or those that are uh, curious about it to, to kind of develop more ideas and, and create a, a deeper, broader software package? Mm -hmm. So myself, I'm not really at the farm very much. I will also say I don't really have any like practical on-farm experience uh, that many of my colleagues actually have. Many of my colleagues have worked with pigs like through many years where I've maybe worked at a pig farm maybe one month altogether. Uh, so my practical uh, skills are actually uh, fairly low, uh, but, but I, I, I always argue that I, I make up for it in um, like data, uh, curiosity and, and my academic skills instead. But, um, but how much am I visiting farms? Not very often. I would say a few times a year, I would go to a customer, do a demonstration, do a startup. Um, but we're at a point where Many things actually happen online. We do the demonstration of the software. Um, we do the startup of the software over the internet. We also like have evaluation meetings, collect uh, ideas for new features online. I think that's very um, has been very accelerated by coronavirus. Um, yeah. 
So I think another thing that we hear from people many times, Josephine, is this idea that, well, if I want to be involved in technology and be an animal scientist, do I need to be technology driven, right? So is that kind of a a hobby of mine, if you will, that I'm always playing with the newest phones and tablets and so forth? Is, Is that something that you need to have if you're wanting to do, from an animal science perspective, work in a animal technology company? Mm. I would probably not define me as being super tech driven. I mean, I've I've always played computer games. I've liked that a lot, like through my teenage years. So you can say I've had my fair share of like computer games and stuff like that, but I don't go out and buy the newest iPhone and I don't get excited by like LED lights with colors or, I mean, I'm not that type of person, but but I think, of course, you need to be somewhat excited about like using technology in the, in pig production, obviously, or agricultural business, because otherwise I don't think it's going to be a lot of fun. You need to see a new feature and be like, oh, that is just like so cool, so nice how it does that. Um, so driven, I would say no, but but I think you have to be naturally excited. But I think that goes for everything you do, really. Everything is much better if you're excited about what you do. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, One of the other things I think that that people tend to think about is is numbers. Well, if I, and you mentioned coding, and coding is completely different, of course, but, uh, and you also mentioned statistics. So maybe let's talk a little bit more there about um, why being interested in numbers or statistics would have value uh, in the role that you serve. So many of our, you can say, or a big deal of, of the, the the problems or, or the challenges we face in support is KPIs, for example. That's a very big part of having a production system. And if you enjoy numbers, enjoy looking at how numbers are combined, understanding numbers, that's a very big advantage of being able to help the customers uh, further and I, I I think already having bachelor's degree a master's degree uh, I mean you're already a really really good step of the way um, about statistics I can probably remember like 10% I remember what a p-value is and uh, the 0.05 you know good or bad that's kind of what I remember and I also remember something about normal distributions and and data like that uh, so I, I use very little of it, but it's it's in the back of my head and I recognize it when I see it, but it's not something that like genetic companies, they use the statistics a whole lot more than we do. Um, but I mean, in my line of work in the company that I'm in, then understanding data and enjoying working with data, it's a, it's a very big, uh, big plus for sure. But I also believe that you can learn it, especially if you have a... A practical background maybe you don't have a university degree but but you understand the kpis from a practical angle so you have a you have a better understanding of them like put into context than i do for example so someone with a practical background can very quickly spot is this number off or is it great and then they can dig into it while i have to wait for the customer to call me and say that number is off. Can you please take, you know, take a look? So I actually think that a practical background is also very beneficial for the, the kind of role that, that I sit in or the work we do in support. Well, and I think that's actually a really interesting point. And I, I think that's a good one too, is that understanding of keep of KPIs or key production indexes or indicators. Um because you're you're absolutely right. If we don't know what we're looking at, we don't know if it's right or wrong. Um, and even being able to communicate that side of economics to it, right? So, especially when you're probably working with your coders, there's lots of different things they can do. But it's more of well, what's important to the farmer and what's going to bring the biggest value. And so, you're absolutely right. That's where an animal scientist or someone who's had some animal experience can understand and communicate to the farmer and then express that back to the to the technology team. Exactly. And also to be able to give some feedback back to the farmer, right? Uh, challenge them a little bit on their 
not old ways, but sometimes uh, farmers have a tendency of um, of staying in the same mindset. And then it's it's actually quite refreshing or can be nice for us to challenge back a little bit. So are you really sure you need to capture this kind of data? Like, what do you use it for um, to also help push the limits a little bit uh, for them also? And I and a developer don't have that that same uh, relationship to the um, to the topics that we're discussing, right? They see it from a code side and from a code side, I mean everything is possible. It's almost like too much. And it's uh, and it's it's also very difficult for us to kind of narrow it down, you know, what's like really cut it to the bone. So what is it what is it that we need and describe it precisely so they can code it in a in a good way and not spend too much time on it. No, and I think that's actually interesting. And you brought it up now a couple of times is this communication to the coder. And uh, you talked about you know, helping them understand what a guilt is or how we're going to define a guilt. And so there's a, an aspect to your role that's that's teaching, right? You're, you're teaching the farmer something new, you know, new technology, but more importantly, you're also teaching people internally and you're finding a way to communicate basically across two different languages. And so um, any tips or, or tricks on, on how to do that and how to help or, or maybe some of the biggest parts that are confusing to, especially to our, our science team that's working on the coding that, that we should be doing a better job of, of educating? I always think it's very important to listen to, I mean, of course, listen to what people tell you, but also uh, maybe listen to what they're not not telling you. Sometimes, let's say I explain something to one of our developers, and he 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 doesn't get it, and I can hear in his voice that he doesn't get it. Then then it's very important to listen to that and try and explain it in a new way. Um, I mean, I always have the like my offset that if I explain something and they don't understand, then I didn't explain it correctly or good enough. So I try to do it differently uh, just to make sure there are no uh, misunderstandings whatsoever. And uh, for farmers or, or educating, I educated farm students uh, last week, for example, showed them the, the system. Uh, I have to remember to speak slowly and show it slowly because something that I, you know, navigate in daily and is what I do eight hours a day it comes very natural to me, but for others, it can be a bit overwhelming, even though I say, oh, it's so simple. You click, 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 click. And they're like, whoa, 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 slow down. Please show it to me again. Um, yeah. So I just be talk slowly, be clear. And also, of course, think about what you say and how you say it to the audience that you are targeting. I mean, the stuff that I show farming students would be different than what I would show a potential customer. Um, it would also be different than what I would show a feed company that are uh, interested in a collaboration. So I, I really try to think about the messages that I relay and, and try to communicate that in a clear way, depending on who I speak to. No, I think that's actually really good. And, and that's a, a good message for anybody that Maybe it's not so much the content that we're sharing, but the way in which we share it as far as just making sure we're at a level that's, that works for them and, or I mean, not, I shouldn't say content, I guess, but the specificities of what we're saying versus more just speaking at their level and, and watching them, really watching them and making sure they're understanding, as you mentioned, or listening to, to them to make sure that whatever we're trying to communicate is clear. Um, so no, I think that's actually really good advice for how you bridge the gap across the two groups. And um, I think that's actually very good. Mm -hmm. And it may take some practice. I mean, I didn't get it right from the very beginning. You know, uh, you can see when people start to zone out, then maybe you're speaking about the, like the wrong stuff that you try and, you know, and get back on track to what they are actually interested in hearing about. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I think that brings us really to kind of our last part of this and, and some of your training was is being a people person and doesn't necessarily mean you have to love people, but you as you were mentioned, you learned how to read people and then communicate accordingly. 
And that is a skill, as you mentioned, that's not something we typically learn in college. Uh, so, you know, any suggestions on on how to do it or is it just practice? Hmm, that's a very good question. I've also thought about that sometimes, like, um, but I think, I think one part is, you know, some, it comes easier to some people than others. And why that does that, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I'm very, you can say it's, it's both good and bad, right? I'm very uh, empathic person. So I, I feel a lot with other people. And I think that's what um, enables me to, to maybe read people also and take their sides. But it's also very difficult to <laughs> be with a, a customer who really wants something and I try and relay that to the team and they completely disagree with me. They're like, I mean, this feature, we're not going to develop this. Nobody's going to use it, only him. And then that's very hard to go back because and tell that to, the, you know, disappoint that, that customer about that. I mean, so it's both good and bad. You also need, I need to learn to, you know, distance me a little bit and not feel so much. Um, but I, I, I think it, you can also for sure practice. I think... It's about maybe learning, um, you know, how you speak to customers, learning, you know, a few sentences, and then then you will start to get the hang of it. Uh, yeah. No, I think that's a that's a great tip, and it's it's one that that we have many conversations around. Um, I can remember my previous job; we you know actually had people come in and work with us at least once every six months on how we communicated internally, how we learned how to read people or, or lead their, read their ways of communication. Um, and, and then of course, how to manage in, in my situation, but you know, whether it's managing or working with a teammate or working with a customer, I think those are very valuable skills. And many times they take just a lot of practice once you, once you learn a piece. Right. And, and so I think that's actually very valuable. I think you can feel if people are really trying, you know, to be better and improve and yeah. So I think it's a skill you can develop. There's also a a, a book called um, uh, like how to make friends, uh, how to influence people and make friends, <laughs> something like that, uh, which gives you, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, very close to manipulation, you can say, but, but I mean, Basically, all communication is kind of manipulation, right? Uh, you deliver a message somehow and they give something back. But that's a very good book if you want to learn to be more people person. I'll have to look at that. The title alone is, is making me laugh this morning. So I think <laughs> that's actually good. It's good. Well, Josephine, I really enjoyed visiting with you, but our time is actually wrapping up a little bit. So um, maybe give a couple of key points that you'd like our audience to take away from today's conversation. So I will say, if you are thinking about joining the IT business in agriculture, in, in agriculture, I would say go for it, for sure. You have so much to give, and it's a career pathway not not talked much about by others because it's not the classical ones you're exposed to, and. And that's, you know, if you have a university degree, if you work at the farm, um, any aspects of agricultural business, I will say go for it if you have, if you ever feel like you want to try it out. Yeah, you have many good skills to, to give to a company like that. That's a great, great point to the, to the audience today. Genesis is the largest independent producer of high, healthy, registered purebred swine on the globe having over 80% of all registered purebred breeding stock in Canada. The Genesis genetic program uses genomic selection strategies focused on productivity, faster growth, efficiency, high yield, and meat quality. To know more, go to genesis.com. That's G-E-N-E-S-U-S dot com. It's time for our famous three. To feed the world's growing population, the animal production industry needs to grow in a sustainable manner. Eastman produces one of the broadest organic acid portfolios in the global market and offers customer-driven swine solutions. Learn more by visiting Animal Nutrition at EASTMAN.com. 
Well, as you know, we as we wrap up, we like to ask our guest speaker a couple of questions. Um, the first question I would ask is, do you have a resource related to our topic today that you would recommend to the audience? I do. I mean, but now that you say recommend to the audience, I'm actually a little bit unsure if it's translated to English. I think some of their material is, but we have um, the Danish Pig Research Center. Uh, they do a lot of um, research for farmers and, and like they go and conduct trials on farms and uh, you can say they're really great database for basic knowledge but also for very like up in time research projects like we just phased out the use of medical sink in uh, in Denmark and they've done a lot of research on that topic for the last two years um, and they get subsidies from different uh, places and they just are very focused and dedicated on uh, bringing value back to uh, pig production in general. Yeah, so that's something I use a lot for knowledge. It's an excellent resource. I do go to their website periodically and mm. I've, I've uploaded many articles in the past. So mm. <laughs> um, it's a very, very good group of, of individuals that do some fantastic research. Mm -hmm. uh, my second question for you is, is there a book that you're currently reading or just finished that that's not related to, to your work that you would recommend to the listeners today? So I recently just finished The Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett, which is a very, you can say, classic historical book. I, it's a, I feel like I'm growing up a little bit. I used to like fantasy books, you know, like with knights and magic and, and uh, dragons and stuff like that. But, uh, but I, I thought I would try something completely different. So I tried The Pillars of the Earth and I was, I was pleasantly surprised. I, I listen as an audiobook because I knit quite a lot. So that's a nice way for me to relax. It's um, a bit slow the first few hours, but it was really, really good. I'm, I start on the sequel now. So uh, yeah, big recommendation uh, from my side. Yeah. Very good. I have not read that one yet. I've heard it and I've, I've heard it's good, but I have not read it. So mm -hmm. um, very good. My last question for you today, Josephine, is really around if you could think of somebody in your life that you defined as successful and you don't need to tell us the name and you um, you can define success however you want to define it, um, what would be a trait that they possess that you think has allowed them to be successful? So I think I've mentioned this trait like early on in our conversation, but I really believe that curiosity it's a really, really, really great trait for being successful. Um, being open-minded, asking questions, not being afraid of of asking questions or uh, even like questions you feel are stupid. Because by being curious, you open up your knowledge space in a whole new way. Um, and I also feel like being curious around, like maybe taking a decision can also help you to take the right decision. Uh, based on your situation, so I, I feel like curiosity is a is a trait that I would uh, would say. I would agree. I think we've heard curiosity a couple times, um, probably in the last six months from our speakers, and so I do think that is actually a very good one to, uh, to possess to be successful. Well, Josephine, I appreciate your time today. Um, it has certainly been a pleasure visiting with you and learning a little bit more, getting a few tips and tricks on how to work within the tech side of of animal agriculture and, and we know this field is certainly growing and, and we hope it continues to grow to help address labor shortages and some of the other challenges that our industry faces. Um, again, for our listeners today, this is Josephine Tulinus, who is with Cloud Farms. Thank you, Josephine. Thank you, Laura. Thank you.